welcome back adventurers to a little episode between the episodes. I'm once again going to read the journal because I think before we attend the council here in Bergen it would be good to be informed as much as we can and this is reading up on people and locations. So here we go. There will be no gameplay in this episode so if you're not interested in the lore and such just skip this one and go on to the next one with actual gameplay. But yeah, here we start. I will not read the quests, um, but this is uh, the quest we are following at the moment. What I meant with going to the war council. But uh, I rather tend to not read the quests, only if I get stuck. Because I want to find out things by myself. <laughs> If it's possible. Sometimes I read up on them, sometimes, sometimes I don't. But yeah, we do that uh, during the gameplay episodes. So we start with the uh, locations. And we do that in chronological order. We read all about the prologue in the last journal reading episode. Um, but there are some things from the first chapter that uh, we haven't read yet. So we know about the Flotsam forests, we know about the brothel, we know about Flotsam, we know about the prison barge, we know about Lubinden, but we still have to read up on the ruined bridge. The stone bridge on the road to Edirne had certainly seen better times. The local troll had been renovating and maintaining it, but this unusual troll collector had succumbed to alcoholism leaving the bridge to fall into ruin. Uh, and he did so because somebody killed his wife. They could mention that. He's not just drinking for fun. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we solved that peacefully. I'm glad about that. Means we didn't kill the troll. Karen's lair. The monster's lair was located near a small shoal by the ancient ruins of an elven bridge. Wrecked riverboats, heaps of algae and the stench of rotting flesh unmistakably identified the spot to which the Cairn had taken a liking. That at least is how it was described to me, for I was in no hurry to risk an expedition through the forest only to tease the cranky old man in his den. When the wind blew from the ruined bridge, one could smell for oneself that there was little exaggeration to the tales of the Cairn's aromatic presence. It stank so bad, my eyes watered. By the way, um, this is all written by Dandelion, so he is uh, referring to himself when he says I. But yeah, we killed the monster, that is history. But I still, it still stinks and it will for some more years. <laughs> The altar of Veopatis. Oh, that's that creepy statue. The forested wilderness lining the banks of the Pontar conceals many secrets, among them an altar dedicated to an ancient deity named Veopatis, nestled deep in a forest glade. The spot is well hidden from prying eyes, and the dangers of the wood discourage those who would seek it previously. Geralt, however, had no fear of monsters and good reason to visit the mysterious site. I wonder what was the good reason, though. There was nothing there. I mean, there was magic and uh, we had to kill uh, the Arachne Queen there, didn't we? Or close to it, at least. But yeah, cool place. I wish uh, we would learn more about the the gods and deities. But I think we found a book about Veopatis, so we did learn about him. The Ruined Elven Baths. Oh yeah, that place, I remember that very well. The inhabitants of Flotsam and its surroundings described the nearby elven ruins in less than flattering terms. They mostly limited themselves to a heap of stones, my lord. Don't be going there alone, or a necker will catch you and other similar phrases. I learned more when I bought Satrig a drink. Where bindweed and briar entwined splintered marble, the buildings of captivating beauty had once stood. Today, only the ruins of the baths 
and elven statues remain, testifying to the past splendor of the place. Yeah, it was very beautiful. So, if you don't fear the Neckers, you should definitely visit it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had to kill um, the Kingslayer. Oh, we didn't kill him. The game didn't let us kill him, but we had to fight the Kingslayer in there. And that was brutal. Jorvith's Hideout. Few had any knowledge of Jorvith's Hideout near Flotsam. The Skoyatel leader used it as a command post from which to coordinate his unit's operations. The way there was dangerous, as it was defended by more than elven swords and arrows. Monsters inhabiting the surrounding forest were its natural guardians. Having a guide increased one's chances of reaching it alive. Yet finding it did not necessarily, not necessarily mean that one would return safely. Upon entering the lion's den, one could only hope for its owner's favor, and not many Dwine could count on that. Uh, we found it by chance, didn't we? After um, talking to you with, so he was not at home, and we were at peace, so nobody attacked us there. And it was where we fought that other arachnid monster when we met you with in person the first time. Or not well, not in person. I mean, we met him, I guess, before that. But when we had the chance to speak him, the, uh, to speak to him the first time. And that is all that's left from chapter one. So let's read up on chapter two, the battlefield. The sight was not much to behold, even on a sunny day. Yet it was here that several years earlier a bloody battle had ended in a magical cataclysm. Rocky gullies opened onto a plain scarred with furrows and craters dug by trebuchet missiles and magical explosions detonated by the sorceress Sabrina Klevisik. Tall reddish grass covered part of the flatland, the rusting armor and bleached bones of the fallen nestled among it. Once the curse was activated, however, a ghastly mist engulfed a section of the battlefield. Within it stretched a world seemingly pulled from a nightmare, a world in which ghosts of the fallen endlessly reenacted the battle that had claimed their lives. So that is what, ha what happened. Because we were in that mist and uh, those fallen ghosts did attack us. Hmm. So it was a magical cataclysm. I hope we learn more about that too. That's interesting. Let's read up on Vergen, where we are at the moment. This town in the north of Edirne was founded by dwarves who established mines in the surrounding hills. As was their custom, they carved their homes and public edifices directly into rock formations, granting Vergen a unique architectural style. The town was an important trade center, one of the roads through it leading into the country's interior. Humans had also attempted to settle in the area, but the disturbances that plagued the Pontar Valley left most of their villages burned in and in ruins. Nevertheless, when we arrived in Vergen, it was teeming with humans in addition to its mainly dwarven population. Saskia's peasant rebels and a group of Edirnian nobles had made camp there and promptly begun to measure each other with menacing glares. Meanwhile, all the groups that had assembled in the area were mistrustful of Jorwith's Koyatel, who strove to keep to themselves with unmistakably elven aloofness. Truly, if not for Hensel's army making camp nearby, the whole rebel would have been at each other's throats in no time. Yeah, we only saw the dwarves, dwarves and the humans. We have no idea where Jorwith's Koyatel are settled for the moment. But I'm sure as uh, when we attend the council and can venture out of town, we will find them all. And that is it with the locations. Let's go into the characters. Uh, we start with the main characters as last time, but uh, I think we read most of them. We know all about uh, Marie-Louisa Lavalette, 
Um, there is some news about Triss Marigold, though. And it is here. The sorceress's greatest desire was to be the one and only woman in Geralt's life and to forget about all the troubles and dangers they had recently experienced. Geralt was close to agreeing to her proposal, yet he knew that it would be impossible to lead a quiet life until he could clear his name. His decision saddened Triss, but the sorceress understood. Triss was kidnapped by Letho. Geralt and I feared what he might do to her. Believe me, it was eating me alive, making rest impossible. Searching Sheila's quarters and talking to her neighbor brought more questions than answers. It appeared that Triss had known the woman she had talked to, but the fragments of the conversation recounted to us remained mysterious. Triss had reached Edirn. There was evidence to prove it. Finding her would prove difficult, however. Uh, didn't she talk to a sorceress, to Philippa? And we know that? Dandelion knew about that sorceress. So... Yeah. Here he writes only uh, that Triss had known the woman. But if it was the sorceress Philippa, then of course she would know her. And we know her too. Or at least Dandelion does. Geralt of Rivia we read. Yeah, there's nothing new here. King Foltest is dead, so there are no new news here. Dandelion? I think there is something new about him, though. Obviously, when Geralt decided to continue his search in Vergen, located in a borderland soon to be engulfed by the flames of war, I chose to accompany him, for the Witcher could at times be naive as a child and knew as much about politics as a ghoul knows about cooking. Thus the chances were slim to none that, bereft of my help, he would manage to find new lands without getting embroiled in some trouble along the way. As his friend, I clearly could not allow that. <laughs> oh, this guy. I wonder if he will attend the council too. Well, I guess so, right? <laughs> oh. Vernon Roach. There is some news about him too. Yeah. So, we knew that already. To put it mildly, Roach was irritated with Geralt's decision and his trust in the Witcher did not grow. Um, the decision that we went with you with, I think, I think, and not with him. Because of his contacts with the Scoia'tael, Geralt lost the chance to work with Ron and Roach. Their ways parted. Yeah, it was that. And I think that's all we hear about Ron and Roach from here, right? Hmm. Well... It is as it is. Buzi Lavalette. Uh, nothing new there. Those are the both child uh, children of Foltest. Uh, we don't know if they play a role in the future of the game. But Vess has some news, doesn't she? Vess had a steady hand and sure eye, making her the best sharpshooter in the unit. Not many could match her at throwing knives either. Why is that news? Hmm. Well, now we know it. And I hope we will somehow meet her again in a friendly encounter. Yeah, I really hope that we don't have to kill uh, Vernon Roaches's people. Huh. I didn't think about that. But yeah, hopefully not. Sheelard Fitzurstalen. Uh, that's uh, the ambassador of Nilfgaard, but we do not know anything new about him, or we cannot learn anything new about him. I don't know where he is now, now that Foltus is dead. Arian Lavalette is dead too, so no news here. The Kingslayer, though. He has, of course, some news. I think we read everything until here, right? Finding him seemed like the Witcher's only chance. 
Yeah. Oh. The mysterious individual now had a name. It appeared that this Letho, whoever he might be, was playing his own game. One in which the Scoia'tael had become an impediment. Yet his ultimate objective remained a mystery to Geralt. Letho, I, I think it's Letho, not Letho. I always say Letho, but I guess that's wrong. So Letho had indeed been working with the squirrels, doing their wet work for them. Geralt would soon learn the answers to many more questions. In the ruins of the Elven Bath, Geralt and the mysterious assassin stood eye to eye a second time. Geralt was surprised by what he learned. Letho of Gulet had been a witcher. What is more, there were other Kingslayers, and they and Letho had worked together to assassinate the two dead northern monarchs. The witcher and the assassin were also no strangers. In fact, Geralt had once saved Letho's life. The discussion ended abruptly as arrows whistled through the air and swords clashed. Letho demonstrated his strength and skills by beating Geralt black and blue. Before leaving, he announced that he was on his way to Edern. The Kingslayer proved true to his word and kidnapped Triss, wounding Cedric mortally in the process. He forced the sorceress to aid him by teleporting them both to Edern. Yeah, if they had let me finish that fight, I would have killed him. <laughs> I mean, it was a hard fight and I died, so yeah, it's it's okay. <laughs> Demavent, the other dead uh, king, there's nothing new about him. But there's of course news about Jorweth. The elf was certainly a dangerous individual. He was not, however, a bloodthirsty monster. Ever cautious and aware of the game he was playing, he jumped at the chance of testing Letho's loyalty, becoming Geralt's ally, at least temporarily. Fighting side by side certainly helps dispel distrust. The Witcher kept his word, which Jorwith appreciated, and the path to further cooperation stood open. The Scoia'tael leader had a vision, and his pursuit of it put him in an altogether different light. Grant, as it was, the plan could either be considered incredibly ambitious or purely insane. Whatever the case, he needed allies. Though if he found none, he was more than prepared to forge ahead alone. Yoweth was loyal towards those who placed their trust in him, and he returned their trust. This was undeniable. His respect for Geralt grew after they freed the prisoners, and the elf would not hesitate to repay the debt he had incurred. Hmm. Okay, in what way, I wonder, but I'm sure we will find out soon. Sultan Chivalry. Where are the news here? The charges that Sultan had contacts with the Skrills were not entirely baseless. Though he did not actively participate in military action, the dwarf knew the unit's leader, Yoweth, among others. It was not surprising, really, that having encountered the aforementioned human spite and ungratefulness at every step, Sultan sympathized with the dwarven and elven freedom fighters. He was balanced in his view, however and valued loyalty to old friends above all else. Sultan went with us to Wurgen and, with enthusiasm worthy of his military past, began training the local militia that would soon see its baptism of fire. Though it appeared they would have a hard time, Sultan was ready to defend the cause he believed in, fighting at the side of elves and men. And... Uh, we didn't meet him yet, right? I think he will be at the council too. So, yeah. Bernardo Rido. I think uh, we read until here. So, this while individual's duplicity, his fidelity to his purse alone, 
were apparent to anyone who paused to look at him. His sale of Flotsam, an important trading post, to the kingdom of Cadwen was to be his crowning swindle. And the provincial ruffian cared little that it would also render him a traitor to his country. Oh, did he? I missed that. So he sold Flotsam to Cadwen and the soldiers that were there were Kedwanian, but they all had um, the coat of arms of um, Temeria, didn't they? Huh. Okay. That's interesting. But, I mean, we knew that he is a shady character, so yeah. We do know, uh, we do know nothing new about uh, John Natalis, and there is news about Sheila the Tunterville. One has to admit that Sheila's help proved to be useful. The sorceress did not fear the monster and bravely fought, aiding the witcher with her powers. It appears Sheila had very specific plans concerning the King Henselt of Catwen and his attempts to father an heir. From what we have been able to tell, the meddling of Sheila and other sorcerers in the world of politics was further reaching, further reaching than anyone had imagined. So she is politically interested and does meddle uh, with uh, the ones in power. Because up there, it's said that she is rather neutral. Yeah. Sheila was not known to interfere in politics, at least not visibly. Well, now we know. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, all other characters are new to us. We didn't read those. Serret. Sometimes a person's name sinks into memory and brings fear to one's heart at its first mention. Who was the mysterious Serret? What goals drove him? And what role would he play? Geralt had yet to learn all of this. And uh, me too, to be honest. Who is that? <laughs> I do not remember one Serret. Well, I think we will find out. Ox. When he first heard Auka's name, the Witcher had no idea who this was. Ha! He did not have the slightest inkling of the role this individual would play in our story. Are these the dwarves, maybe? that we talked to in the pub or yeah maybe <gasps> no are these the other witchers the other kingslayers I think that's it yeah I guess I'm not sure though Henselt the witcher once said that in his life he had met thieves who res resembled city councillors councillors who were like backing louts, harlots who behaved like princesses, princesses who smelled like pregnant cows, and kings who looked like thieves. How do pregnant cows smell? I wonder. King Hensel did not look exactly like a thief, but with all due respect, he was not far off. He owned this resemblance only partly to his bearded countenance, beady eyes and wandering yet penetrating gaze. His annexation of Lohmark, called Upper Edern by its natives, at a time when Edern was fighting off the Nilfgaardian horde at its southern border, was also considered a theft. The now-dead King Demovend judged this deed severely and communicated this in curt yet resonant words. Yet that was not the sole reason for King Hensel's reputation as an unpleasant person. Much bolstered by the monarch's ambitions and quarrels with his neighbors and by his ruthless policies towards non-humans, who he persecuted with a passion, squandering his realm's strength and funds. The aging Henselt did not have a living heir, and the rumor was that he had found producing another son somewhat troublesome. Henselt's virility may have lessened with age, but his ambition certainly had not. The king wanted to wage a war and reclaim Lomark, a province he had already given up once, no matter the cost. Ooh, okay. If he had given up 
low mark it used to be in his kingdom. Hmm. I don't know. Well, another king that might die soon. Philippa Eilhard. Uh, that's, there she is. Now we can read up on her. This was hardly the first time Geralt and I encountered Philippa Eilhard, jewel of the court at Tretogor, and once the trusted sorceress of King Visimir II. Philippa was one of the most talented mages of those times. Only a handful ever mastered the art of polymorphy. Her intellect and the influence she held at the Redanian court were not to be underestimated. Proud, independent and extremely beautiful, as graceful in a fanciful yet elegant dress as in a men's traveling outfit, she was beyond any doubt one of the most attractive women I have ever known. Yet I would not count Philippa among the most pleasant of females, despite her indisputable, though chilly, charm. Her gaze alone was, was enough to make the most confident men shudder, and the mere thought of spending a night with her would make their flesh creep. At the time, Philippa Eilhard was staying in the town of Vergen, as part of Saskia, the dragon slayer's inner circle. Her motives remained unclear, to say the least. The former court magician had never been known for her altruism. However, one cannot deny that without her help, Geralt would not have found his way through the mag magical mist. Philippa rendered him an invaluable service at that time. Yeah, right, she was the owl. Saskia. Nothing drives a revolt forward like the right leader, especially one who is a young girl known for performing miraculous feats of valor on the battlefield. From Shoan of the Ark coast to the infamous Falka, history is full of women who led fanatically devoted hosts to victory. Interestingly, all those heroines were not only charismatic, but also extremely beautiful. The squint-eyed, gap-toothed and pockmarked generally have trouble rousing the masses. Saskia, whom men would follow into fire, was no exception. She was a smooth-skinned lass with blonde hair, dark brown, large eyes and shapely lips. Her full breasts perfectly complemented her rounded hips. In other words, she was the ideal icon for a rebellion. For, dear reader, if a man in battle receives the appropriate motivation in the form of a lovely female Ars, he is likely to achieve miracles in its wake. When there is no such Ars to lead the way, the freedom fighter's thoughts quickly turn to harvest time, his own woman and a half pint of booze at the inn. But I don't know about that. News had already reached us of the heroic Saskia, the woman who held Catwin's armies at bay. At the time, however, it all seemed like little more than exaggerated rumors. As with any true hero, there were many incredible tales about Saskia. Some claimed she was invulnerable to fire and had thus survived that terrible battle when Sabrina had rained the very flames of hell down upon the combatants. The girl was also famous for killing a dragon. One would be hard pressed to find better material for a local hero. Yeah. I really want to learn, learn more about her and, and what's this all about with the dragon and uh, what other deeds she did. Because it's definitely not only her ass who led people into rebellion, there must be more to it. Prince Dennis. After King Demovan's death, Prince Dennis became heir to the Edernian throne, at least in name. However, pride and chilly disposition rarely win the love of one's subjects, and that was very much Stennis' problem. His youth did not strengthen this, his claim either. Though no one openly questioned the prince's claim to the crown, Stennis did not have enough support to actually have it placed upon his head. Given his situation, Sitting out important events would have been political suicide. 
The war for the Pontar Valley gave him the ideal chance to bolster his position by demonstrating what a good ruler he would make. History has shown time and time again that when a, that when a realm is in chaos, deeds rather than words grant one legitimacy in the eyes of one's subjects. Stannis greatly desired to prove himself the equal or superior of the Virgin of Edern. He had strong support from the nobility, yet the common folk had few reasons to sympathize with him. Hmm. Okay. So I think if he wins the war, he will be king. If not, he will be dead, most probably. Apart from a few chance encounters at official banquets, Geralt had the occasion to meet and speak more extensively with this sorcerer on Thanet Island during the bloody coup, when all manners of mages jumped at each other's throats and their council and conclave ceased to exist. Detmold and his brother Trithhelm, both in the service of King Esterad of Kovir at the time, attempted to remain neutral as events unfolded. To no avail, however, as those who had allied themself, themselves with Nilfgaard thought nothing of the impartiality of others, and many mages simply perished, brought down in fanciful ways by their colleagues' spells or pierced by the arrows of the Skoyatel summoned to the island by the plotters. Trithel met just such a fate, while Deathmold saved himself by fleeing. Deathmold then filled the opening for a sorcerer advisor at the court of King Hensel of Catwin, and proceeded to place all of his abilities at the monarch's disposal. Yeah, we saw him shortly. Huh, and Sheila de Tanzerville um, wants his post, doesn't she? So most probably she wants to get rid of him, or he of her. Well, we'll see, we'll see. Yarpen Sikrin. Our friendship with Jargon Sikrin stretched back a long time. It began during the famed hunt for the Golden Dragon, which not only was not caught, but also beat up its hunters. Those events were later described in one of my ballads, and anyone interested in the story should read it. Sikrin, like most of his kin, is characterized not only by his love of gold, but also by his broady sense of humor, sober outlook, pragmatism and loyalty to his friends. Geralt mentioned that he later met Yarpen and his lads in His Majesty's Secret Service, the Majesty in question being Hansard of Catwin, for whom they were escorting a secret cargo. Though their own situation was not cheerful at all, they nevertheless aided the Witcher, easily proving that a dwarf won't abandon a friend in need. Yeah. Cool. So that is all about the main characters. So secondary characters, uh, I think we know most of them about. Well, there are a few we don't. So let's go through them. New boy we know. Count Edgeberry, we know he's dead. Arthur Tales, we know. The Archpriest, Louis Murs, nothing new here. Einar Gosel, we read about him. Margot, there's a new line for her. It turned out that Margot was a spy for Joweth. She decided to use that connection to avenge her lover's death. Yeah. Fioravanti, we know about Gaspar and Farid, we know about those two. And Arnold. I think all the others are new. I think. Yeah. So, Milana. Life was not easy for the non humans of Lotsam, and Milana was no exception. The elven woman was suspected of leading soldiers into Scoyatel ambushes, a charge that could easily send her to the scaffold. The elven woman had indeed been luring soldiers into a trap. Her fate was now in Geralt's hands. Melana was arrested and charged with being an accessory to murder. She suffered the consequences of her deeds. I don't know if that was the right thing to do, but, um, well, we also have to live with the consequences of our deeds, right? Hmm. 
Well, goodbye. Va fail, Melada. Va fail. Sandler. In Lobinden, tanning and leatherworking was the trade of Sandler, a skillful and reliable artisan. He ran a small stall with goods of his own making, but also accepted commissions for specific products. In these hard times, he made ends meet by working hard with his own hands. That's the guy who had um, the head of the female uh, troll, but he didn't kill her. So yeah, but we could have won it back, but I don't know for what reason, so yeah, I didn't do it. He was also very good at uh, poker, so I don't know. <laughs> I didn't want to lose too much money. Chorab, or Chorab? Yeah, maybe. Was Lobinden's alderman. A simple man, he nevertheless blended his penchant for storytelling with a desire to teach imp and impart wisdom. His tales pertained to times long past, traditions, traditions worthy of preservation and legends that had all but been forgotten. He cared for the community he led and represented, and any honest villager could count on his help. Yeah, he seems to be a good man. Cedric. For reasons that were not entirely clear, this wise and experienced elf had chosen to live among humans. He worked for the people of Flotsam as a lookout and trapper, and none had a better knowledge of the surrounding forests. Whether it was the local plants and wildlife, or the dangers that lurked amidst the trees, Cedric was the local inhabitant's chief and often only source of information. Heroism sometimes exacts the highest price. When Triss's life was in danger, the elf did not hesitate to defend her and was wounded mortally. As it turned out, that Cedric died, though his sacrifice was not in vain. Well, hopefully we couldn't rescue Triss yet. So if she dies too, what I don't think, uh, or I think I even know that she won't, uh, because she appears later on and in The Witcher 3, so she cannot be dead. Um, yeah, but, uh, well, yeah, so I think his sacrifice was indeed not in vain. Rupert. Geralt first encountered Rupert near the ruins of the asylum in the forest beyond Flotsam. The Adyrian medic claimed he had come to the area with his friend Critley in search of rare herbs. However, it appeared they had underestimated the dangers lurking in both the forest and the ruins. Something was missing from his story, however. Rupert had been a medic in a field hospital during the war. He and his friends had committed a crime back then. Years later, the wrath of the Nilfgaardian soldier they had tortured to death summoned them to the scene of the crime, so to have its revenge. Even though Rupert was a complete criminal, Geralt did not give him to the wrath. He was commoned to drive both villains away. Yeah, we spared them. Critley. Rupert's friend was in a dire state, lost amid sober ruins in a wilderness forsaken by gods and humans alike. Geralt found him easily and learned more about him, including what had led him to take such risks. Gridley had been stationed in the area during the war. His units had tortured an Nilfgaardian soldier to death, all in the name of finding a treasure. Years later, the murdered man's wrath used its power to force Gridley and Rupert to return to the site of their crime. Geralt did not hand Gridley over to the demanded soul, yet he drove him and his friend away, ordering the villains to leave the area immediately. Yup, we did that. Aneska. The local herbalist in Lobinden took care not to stand out in any way. Though some people respect women who know much about herbs and folk medicine, others fear them. Skilled herbalists are oft thought to be witches and suspected of sorcery, so they must remain mindful that human mistrust can quickly turn into hostility. Yeah, she was a nice one. The Troll of Flotsam. Oh, here we learn more about him. 
Like most of his kind, the troll living near Flotsam had built a stone bridge and demanded a toll from those crossing it. The folk of Lobinden quickly realized it was a preferable alternative to keeping the structure in good order themselves, so the troll's presence was not a problem for anyone. But believe it or not, the troll took to drinking like the most degenerate hobo, thus proving that alcoholism is not unique to the more developed races. A personal tragedy was behind the troll's drunkenness, the death of his wife. She had been killed by unknown asylums. Once the death of his beloved had been avenged, the troll pulled himself together, promising to rebuild the bridge and quit drinking. But we do not know if he did so, because the bridge was still broken when we left. So hopefully he did stand to his promise. Comparing Dimitri to a Sangvebari hyena would be an insult to the poor animal. Unlike the beast, this scoundrel fed not only on carrion, but also on human and non-human misfortune. It was thus that he gathered his blood money. Even mentioning Dimitri in this story elevates him far more than he deserves. Thus, let us merely note that the Witcher took his life and say nothing more of the son of a bitch. Okay, I'm good with that. <laughs> we move on. <laughs> Ciaran had served in Yorvath's unit as the Elven Commander's adjutant. Captured and imprisoned on the prison barge by Lurido's men, his position was unenviable to say the least. Yet he still demonstrated the pride and stubbornness so characteristic for the Ensaid. Um, did we rescue him in the end? When uh, we killed all the men on the barge and sailed away with the prisoners? I hope so, right? We didn't see him though later on because we went to the Dwarven uh, village. Huh. Dare. The elven girl at the brothel in Flotsam was a favorite of many clients and of Margot herself. Unfortunately, she was bestially murdered by the blood drunk mob during the massacre. Yeah, that's terrible. And we couldn't rescue her either. Elias. Scoyatel units are made up chiefly of young, rash elves who need not think twice before they take up arms in the fight for non-human freedom. Elias was one such elf and was considered one of the best warriors in Jovis' unit to boot. Was he the one with whom we went to the barge in his unit? Hmm. Maybe, I don't know. Cecil Burden. When we arrived in Rurgen, we learned that the town's elder was named Cecil Burden. This former dwarven miner was typical of his kin, realistic, substantive and possessed of a sober outlook. Rurgen needed an administrator like that, so Burden was, beyond all doubt, the right dwarf in the right place. Um, but we didn't meet him yet. We met his nephew, who led us to the pub. I think it was his nephew, I'm not sure about that. Scalen Burden. Oh, yeah, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> Cecil's nephew, the young Scalen Burden, had been taken in by the Aldermen after the lad's parents perished in one of the non-human massacres that occurred in Edirne. As friendly, hardworking and efficient as his uncle, Scalen took it upon himself to act as Virgen's official representative in his uncle's absence, providing all newcomers to the town with any information or assistance they needed. That's nice. Thorak. The local rune master had been an important figure in the dwarven community of Virgen since time immemorial. At present that role was filled by Thorak, a dwarf who had taken up the legacy of his master Baltimore a few years earlier. Thorak ran his workshop impeccably earning the respect and trust of his kin. He offered services of the highest quality and, like any ambitious artisan, was looking for a way to perfect his techniques and abilities. But um, we took up a, um, a contract searching for the other rune master, right? The one that was vanished. So yeah, maybe we'll learn more about him. 
uh, Baltimore it must be then, right? Here's so. Shit, stench and rats are inherent elements of every larger population center. Unable to dispose of the first two, the authorities of Vergen were trying to deal with the latter. Here so was a rat catcher they had hired, but it was worth noting that some of the traps he was selling were large enough to catch a wolf. A highly talented, talented individual, the man known as Irzo had dabbled in many professions. From his time as a rat catcher in Wurken, he still had a wide selection of traps among his wares. They were, in his words, for rodents among others. <laughs> Yeah, so we can uh, buy all um, the traps we need and bait too, right? That's that with the characters. Let's look at the monsters. We know about the dragon. We read about the Cairn. Um, but not yet the monsters entry. I'm not sure, are these the entries from the books? Yeah, I think so, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, but we go through it, so if you like you can pause the video and read it by yourself. But we read the books during the gameplay and I will continue doing so, so if we have book entries here I won't read it. The Rot Fiend, yeah those are the books that we bought from the dwarf, wasn't it? The Necker, the Harpy and the Wraths. We can craft a lot of things now, we had only three when I last uh, checked the journal or when we last had the, the reading episode. Now we can make a Robot Switcher Silver Sword and Draga Hide Reinforcements, but uh, yeah, we can even make it. Harpy Trap, which is a superb silver sword, well-balanced daggers, leather, Karen Carapace Reinforcement, but we don't have the Karen skin. We used it for the Karen Carapace Armor, uh, robust cloth and conflagration. That's all we can make. Then this is a tutorial. This is quite interesting with the uh, how how the attributes um, are being distributed. So if you would like to read that, there it is. Then all the others I don't think we have to read because. Um, these are just, yeah, the tutorials that pop up in the game during gameplay. So, we know all about them. But there you go. Our first monster. <laughs> okay, go through these. Just in case somebody's interested. And that's that. So, let's go on to alchemy. We had those when we read the journal last. All of these, Simon Swallow, Tawny, a Tawny Owl, Dancing Star, Dragon Stream. Yeah, and these down there are new. There we go. And it's quite useful to read those because they have information about um, potions you can combine and things, so let's read about them. Crape shot. While Alfred Nabel's most important invention failed to find broad application, it proved splendid as the basis for Crape Shot Bomb, a highly democratic explosive that wounds everyone within rage. <laughs> Whether human or monster, <laughs> a democratic explosive, <laughs> that's good. The Grape Shot is effective against nearly all creatures except perhaps the most powerful. Moon Goose provides protection against the Karen's highly venomous mucus. This potion should be consumed before fighting the Karen, and this we did. Red Haze Perhaps the most insidious invention of Sericanian alchemists, the reddish haze emitted by this bomb upon detonation causes hallucinations and aggression, leading creatures with which inhale the gas to fight each other. The bomb is ineffective against creatures that cannot be hexed. Ah, I didn't know that for example. And we never used it. Sericanian Sun. 
The explosion of the Sericanian sun is so abrupt and bright that it instantly, though temporarily, blinds anyone who glances at it. Foes thus blinded become easy prey for the Witcher. This bomb is ineffective against monsters that cannot be blinded. Okay, that makes sense. The stench bulb. <laughs> it's ineffective against monster monsters that cannot smell, most probably. This bomb releases a cloud of gas whose odor is so unbearably foul that it chases away even dwarves, not to mention road fiends and bull wars. A practical choker might use it to ruin a banquet, but witchers use stench bulbs to flush monsters out of their lairs or to catch a breather during an exhausting fight. A breather with that stench around? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Wolf. Witches who drink the wolf potion are more agile during fights. Their special attacks, like those causing poison, poisoning or heavy bleeding, are more accurate and effective. The potion has no known side effects. When imbibed, the brew can cancel the side effects of the Maribor Forest and Regina potions. Potion causes minor intoxication when imbibed. Wolf is recommended for witches who apply oils to their swords or specialize in inflicting additional effects, such as incineration during fights. So I think this is a pretty good potion. And we can combine it with Maribor Forest and Virga potion. Insectoid oil. This blade crease increases sword damage dealt to arachnids and creatures similar to insects in their physiology. It is the most effective oil against monsters of this type. This oil is effective against humans and monsters other than insectoids. Okay, that makes sense for an insectoid oil. Necrophage oil. This blade grease increases sword damage dealt to necrophages, for example, or creatures that devour corpses. It is the most effective oil against monsters of this type. This oil is ineffective against humans and monsters other than necrophages. Spectre oil. Witches apply this grease to their blades before fighting ghosts, apparitions and all manner of damned fa phantasms. It is the most effective oil against foes of this type. This oil is ineffective against humans and other monsters than and monsters other than wraths. Okay, cool. And uh, the glossary. We did learn more about the wild hunt, although I do not know if it was in a book, but I know I don't think so. We read it, or oh, we read only the first passage here. One of the insane asylum's patients claimed to have been abducted by the wild hunt and taken to a world where unicorns saunter about lush elven gardens. When he finally succeeded in escaping the hunt's grasp, he returned to this world only to find that his children had aged and died. So many years had passed. Stories of the Wild Hunt do not appear in the Dwarven and Elven cultures. It is quite interesting, for the Elder Races must have faced the Hunt long before humans did. As it seems the Dwarves ignore everything on mutual terms, while the Elves are mysteriously silent on that subject. According to the Nordlings, the Wild Hunt is a procession, or rather a caval cavalcade of skeletal horsemen. They rush across the sky on the bony remains of steeds. Clad in rusty remnants of armor, they wear jagged swords at their wrists. Like comets, the Wild Hunt is an omen of war, which has been confirmed beyond all doubt. The spectral cavalcade ventures out in search of victims every several years, but its harvest was never as rich as just before the last war with Nilfgaard, when over 20 souls went missing in Novigrad alone after the hunt passed through. Curiously, Elven and Dwarven legends make not the slightest mention of the Wild Hunt. Okay. Cool, cool. So, yeah, the Wild Hunt is pretty important, so it's good when we read those. We read that, we read about magic, and we read about Veopatis in, uh, during uh, gameplay episodes. 
We read about the Pontar Valley, Edirne, Temeria, Redania, and Catwin. And we read about Scoia'tael and the Conclave of Thuthresses. And that is it for today's journal reading episode. Uh, in the next episode, uh, we will continue with the gameplay and uh, yeah, attend the Wool Council and see what's going on here. And if we can get out of those gates, finally. I hope so. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll see in the next episode. Thank you so, so much for watching this one. Have a wonderful and adventurous day. And goodbye.